snap. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Am I here? Am I alive? Am I here? I feel like I am. But who's to say if the internet doesn't tell me every day that I exist? I'm Mike Murphy, one half of the Brothers Murphy, and I'm here to do a, a kind of a first look at Ezra Nehemiah. I just came in. We're going to be covering this one in October, in a couple weeks, ahead of its uh, campaign on Kickstarter. Um, I sound good. Okay, 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 or at least I sound. Um, uh, yeah, so we're, we just got this in. We are uh, obviously huge fans of Garfield games in general. Um, and so when we heard about this game and it being referred to as a Garfield greatest hits game, meaning they borrow from this game of theirs, they borrow from that one, uh, we were all in. <laughs> and the theme is cool too. Uh, really cool. So this is on their, in their, uh, uh, oh gosh, what do they call it? Ancient Anthology. Uh, so this follows in the line of like Hadrian's Wall, Legacy of You, now this. So these are set in history. Most of their games are set in, in history and stuff. But these are outside of like the West Kingdom trilogy or the South Tigris, which they're working on now. So they do these ancient anthology games uh, kind of like once a year, once every year-ish. Anyway, so uh, I have read the rule book for this, and uh, we have not played this game yet. So we're just gonna, I'm just going to give you the lay of the land kind of today and, uh, and just, you know, explore it together is what we'll do. So uh, in this game, let me just read, let me read you a little intro. Let me read you a little, little intro they provide us. Um, it looks Garfield dense for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's got a lot going on, but it's kind of in that... Garfield Games thing where there's like only three action types you can do. Uh, within that, there's a couple of options of what you do. And, and, and of course, it's about kind of managing those resources and your banners and stuff to kind of power up those actions. But it, it they always do a good job, I feel like, of like giving you only a few options and creating a ton of stuff to munch on within just that. So uh, aim the game. Obviously, be the one with the most victory points. <laughs> um, so we're going to be uh, building the temple, rebuilding the city walls and gates, and teaching the Torah to returning exiles. All right. So this is in the first year as King of Persia, Cyrus the Great insisted, uh, sorry, issued a decree in writing to the Israelite exiles living under his rule, uh, and bringing them back in and stuff. So we are um, going to be teaching the Torah, uh, building the temple and, we're, and the altar, uh, rebuilding the walls and the gates and stuff that were destroyed once upon a time. What's up, Nick? Um, can you turn your mic uh, facing up? Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, rebuilding city walls, teaching the Torah, working on uh, you know, building up the temple and stuff and, and kind of just rebuilding in general in Jerusalem, uh, which I think is pretty dang cool. Um, so this game, again, has been referred to as a, like, greatest hits of Garfield Games game where uh, they have... There'll be aspects that you see... I, I feel like this borrows a lot from, like, Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Personally, it seems to borrow the most heavily from that in terms of you are going to be hoping to have a lot of icons on your player board, uh, in this case of either blue, red, or gray, uh, in order to kind of power up your action. So if I'm doing the red action, which has to do with the temple and the altar here, so this is the temple uh, temple Mount right here in the altar track just here. They require red banners. And the more you have, uh, it's kind of like a currency and stuff. So that reminds me kind of of uh, uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom where you hope to have a bunch of like your ink wells and stuff or those little black crosses to kind of power up the manuscripts action. It's also referred to as attributes. That kind of like points toward Paladins of the West Kingdom a little bit as well where you want to be at certain thresholds. But here you're kind of spending, not spending, but using up your banners as kind of like a virtual currency, uh, which is pretty cool. What's up, Mary Lou? What's up, everybody in chat? 
if and as there's questions, I'll do my best to answer uh, as we kind of just chit chat about this. This is kind of meant to be very free form and everything. If you're watching this on YouTube after the fact uh, and not watching the live, just turn on the live chat so you can see what the heck I'm referring to if ever I just respond out of nowhere seemingly to uh, some unasked question. It was probably asked in chat. So, um, yeah, so you have these banners you're going to be using. There's all sorts of ways you can kind of... Uh, get banners for your turn to sort of use as this uh, currency. So again, that reminds me of kind of Viscounts where uh, you're gonna be kind of trying to line stuff up using your little display here with your character cards. So we have character cards here. Let me see, actually, let me build a little punch in real fast um, just to make my life a little more radical. Um, how do I copy you? There we go, copy. See if I can just paste you right in here. Boom. Don't worry, I'm still here. Kabam. But let's just build this. Zooming in, you're seeing you're peeking behind the curtain now. Boom. We're gonna do this so you can kind of see the player area. That'll do. That'll do just fine. All right. Isn't this fun? Watch Mike take too long to get a shot lined up that he likes. Um, kabam. All right, so let's start a little player area and stuff. And every turn, we're going to be playing one of these player cards. We're going to have four in hand. Let me give a quick little shuffle. It's one busy board. Hey, you know, when there's games got a lot going on, there's a lot going on. You know what I'm saying? Uh, busy boards never bothered me, but it is funny how people hang on to that. Uh, all right, so we have our character cards here and stuff. There's a lot going on here. They're busy board, busy character cards. There's a number of things to kind of pay attention to. You're going to play one of these out every turn into one of your three stacks. Every round, uh, there's three rounds, and I should say, within each round, there are six days and then the Sabbath and stuff. So we're kind of in a fictional uh, three-week period. This, of course, what's going on in the game in Rebuilding Jerusalem happened over like a couple of centuries, I think. But... For board game purposes, <laughs> it's in three very busy weeks uh, with six days of work, AKA playing uh, a card, taking a turn with the Sabbath as like the day of rest where scoring happens and we kind of reset and we do that three times, okay? So three, three weeks. So every turn, you're gonna play one of your cards to one of your piles. Uh, each pile can have a maximum of two cards in the stack. So you will basically play on each of these three slots two different times over the course of uh, that first or second or whatever round you're in. So on the top left, the main thing you're gonna notice is banners that they provide. Uh, they each kind of seem to have like a, like this one's sort of a universal person, but this one has like two gray banners. And these, this one has two red and then, or actually three red, I should say. They're really hyper focused on the red. Uh, and this has red, red and blue. So if I chose like one of these to play, blam, I can do that. But say I'd played a few rounds before, so you're going to start to line up where you have a bunch of icons. So again, if I played these two cards first and then drop this one in, I now get to count up all of my red banners if I'm doing the red banner action, which is up here in the temple, for example. So that's the kind of Viscount-ness. It doesn't go kind of like uh, the, the slow conveyor belt of cards. Uh, like I could right now cover up this card and stuff and, and then build out that way. But it has that kind of like you're going to be building a tableau of, uh, of these icons on a card. Um, so for the most part, when you're playing stuff down, you're going to mostly just pay attention to the banners. And depending on which action you want to do, there's three main actions. One deals with red banners, one gray, one blue. You'll count up all of those. Uh, we also have like things you can place up here, which might give you additional banners of a certain color. Uh, these cards will tuck throughout the game, so there'll be like additional permanent banners there. So you'll have all these things to look at to uh, get your final, <laughs> like this is how many banners I have. And that's sort of, again, your currency for that turn because certain actions and things will require like three red banners or one red banner or five and stuff like that. And so you'll have that pool of virtual banners to use to uh, to power up your action stuff. Uh, this is a one to four player game, Joanna. I'm gonna catch up real quick on chat. Uh, hi from South Africa, hello to you. Oh man, that's so cool. Um, this is how the magic is made, Jared. You already know it. <laughs> Showing you the peek behind the curtain. <laughs> uh, uh, when's this coming out? This is, com this is gonna be hitting uh, uh, crowdfunding in October. And their games usually 
uh, deliver within a year of their campaign. So I'd say this will come out next summer would be my guess uh, based on their track record and it will be crowdfunding in uh, a month, a little less than a month. Um, any uh, estimate on base game price at this point? Uh, I don't know. They often, on their crowdfunding, their games are the most cheap they're gonna be. And I feel like they often land at very affordable prices. I would say that this will land around $50. Uh, they typically um, have a, a price point around that, but I don't, I don't know specifically about this. Um, they completed building the wall in 52 days. Okay, so it's, that's not that much of a stretch then. That's, this is, we're doing the wall parts kind of the most accurate, I suppose, and the whole general uh, movement here took more than three weeks. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna be dealing with all these red banners and stuff. So we're gonna be on a turn playing one card to your tableau from a hand of four. For the most part in the game, you'll have a hand of four. You might not in the last round, but from what you got. The other things we're gonna wanna pay attention to, uh, on the card is the top right is going to be uh, something that will score points during the Sabbath, during the, the end of round kind of scoring phase and stuff. And these will be have to do with the cards that are tucked here. We'll all be able to score. So that's when this top, top part will come into play. The other thing is, is at the bottom, there will always be some sort of trade that a character card provides on the turn that you play it. So if I played like these two cards here, I couldn't make use of either of these trades if I'm playing this card. This is the trade that I have available to me. And they come in a different couple flavors. So the first one here, like this musician, for example, in my deck as a blue player here, I'd have to pay a silver, sorry about that, pay a silver to whoever uh, has claimed basically built the water gate around the board. If no one has built that yet, it goes to the supply or maybe actually onto the gate card itself. Uh, so you have to pay a little money and then this allows me to either pay three silver for four food or five silver for six food. So I have one option. I can choose one of the two options there uh, to get some silver uh, spent to get some food or some other resources. The uh, other flavor that these will come in is basically turning in resources for silver. So the Fountain Gate doesn't have a, uh, this doesn't have a specific payment that's required. Uh, I can turn in one cinders, the black resource, or one wood for one or two silver as many times as I want. I can turn in those resources for silver uh, as much as, or as little as you like. So that's a trade that's also available to you. So on your turn, You'll do your main action, one of the three main actions which we'll talk about in just a second here. You can do the trade that's on the card that you just played, uh, and then you can play out a worker here under one of these slots here to take the ability. So if I went here, for example, oopsie, so a little dual layer board. If I place this here, I'd get two silver and a food, for example, as a trader, or you can play a worker as an elder and get like some temporary banners and a little thing. So here I'd get two red banners and a food. So if I was doing the, the red action, I really wanted to power it up, maybe I would use a worker as an elder uh, to do that. So all your workers are kind of generic, but where they get placed will dictate what they are. So if they're up here, they're a trader. If they're here, they're an elder. They might get placed as like a farmer or a laborer at the end of the round, right before the Sabbath. If they're here, they're a Levite. If I'm saying that incorrectly, I apologize. I haven't looked up the pronunciations. Uh, if they're over here uh, in the main board doing uh, teaching the Torah and stuff, they'll be a scribe. So depending on where they get placed, that's how they're defined. But there are a lot of places you can kind of place out your workers. So again, main action, you can do the trade on the card that you just played. You can place one of your workers here as a trader and or one of your workers there as an elder to kind of like power up your turn. But you will always do a main action. That is the thing you must do. Uh, the rest is all uh, voluntary, if you want. Even playing this game is voluntary. You can just say, I, I reject all of it. I'm not gonna play the game, period. That's also an option. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, Jared, real quick, says, I really like Garfield games I've seen and tried. Uh, main challenge seems to be keeping up with how fast they come out with new ones. So many games, not time to play. They are... Uh, prolific and organized. Like they, I mean, they, they just are, every time they do kind of like a yearly, like this is what we have coming up, there's a ton of stuff. 
it's very impressive and so high level. Um, yeah, it's uh, I'm blown away by it all the time. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> how? Um, how much difference to think about this game is going to be great. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, going, I think, to be one of those games that, like, will break your brain in terms of, like, which action do I do? It's pretty simple. No, it's not. What about this? What about that? The resources. How do I do this? How do I get the right banners and stuff? There'll be so much to munch on, I imagine. Uh, I think this will be amongst their heavier games just because it borrows from, like, Paladins and Viscounts and stuff, none, none of which are light games. Uh, and there's so many, I think, directions you can go, so many things you can um, just think about. One other thing you can do on a turn, like I said, you can trade with people. It's like an auxiliary action. Or you can develop your tiles. So these tiles here are randomly assigned. They are different. Uh, randomly assigned to players. And they have the ability to be upgraded. So here I could pay eight silver because when you go in between turns, you can only store, like, I can only store six resources. Uh, some people have to store more or fewer. But here I can pay eight resources and flip this over. And then I have unlimited storage and I get to retrieve a worker right before the Sabbath and assign them as a laborer or a farmer. Um, and so you can upgrade all these. They're each worth two points if you upgrade them as well. So, you know, just that to think about too. So let's talk about the three actions, the simple three actions that are in this game. That's it, basically a filler. Uh, <laughs> uh, I agree, Garfield Games is a powerhouse. Um, uh, Bob Orgain says, I think Nehemiah was uh, governor for 12 years and came back a second time for an unspecified length so that gives the game designer some flexibility in the game length. Yeah, right on. I like that. There are a lot of gates. Yeah, we got several. And in a two-player game, one and two-player game, this top row has all these like neutral walls and these gates are already done. So we don't worry about this in one and two-player games. Uh, in a three-player game, I think like this middle section will be filled in. Four-player game, it'll all be open. But basically, in a one- and two-player game, which I'm sort of simulating here, we only have the bottom kind of row and the sides to deal with, not the top. Um, so we have a player aid right here. The whole game is boiled down to this one thing. <laughs> it tells you what you can do. Uh, so you got to play a character card, take a main action. You can optionally take an auxiliary action, which, again, is use a trader, uh, make a trade with the card, or develop a tile and then you can use a trader and an elder if you wish uh, at any point during your turn. Uh, you can do those things. You just can't do it in the middle of an action, if that makes sense. You can't be like halfway through something and do something. And in general, if you ever get like resources from an action, uh, I don't think banners are ever rewarded mid-turn, but if they are any of that, it's immediately available for use. So you can, for example, we have to clear this rubble. This is the different rubble cubes. Um, from a, you know, busted up section of wall, and I could immediately use that to build that wall if it was useful. Uh, only three actions, basically a gateway game. That's what I'm talking about. These games are easy. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, there's so much to think about. Uh, so let's talk about the red action here. So the red action is going to deal with kind of just this section of the board here. So this little bottom part. This is the uh, temple we are building and the altar track here. So these are gonna use red banners. So let's just say I load it up here. It's my third turn of the game. I'm just rocking out with a ton of red banners. I would count up all my red banners. In this case, let's say I also put an elder up here just to just be really hit it hard. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight from this. This is just temporary. Again, if I had an elder here before, this is not still active this is only active on the turn you play that elder is that row or if you use a traitor that's the only time that is active so just note that boom but say i just did that so i have what i say one two three four five six seven eight red banners uh and i can use these red banners to build up on this here uh temple or advance along the altar track uh, uh, oh my gosh, Benesh, thank you so much for the uh, super chat. I appreciate it. Thanks to, <laughs> thanks to you guys. My wallet cries every week. Well, you, you don't spend your money on us, then you got games to buy here. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, very generous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so again, we're going to do, this is the, I think, I think it's the temple and altar action. Let me double check the names. Again, I haven't played this game yet. I'm just, I just got excited 
reading the rules and I want to talk about it. Um, and the, there are uh, reminders about each of the three main actions right here as well as your auxiliary actions and stuff like that. Um, yeah, temple and altar. Look at me, I know it, I know things. So here, uh, you can add a Levite to your track before you do anything, because how many people you have uh, committed here is going to dictate how many kind of uh, transactions, I'll say, you can do on during this action. So uh, say I do that here. If you're going to do that, you have to pay the food cost. In this case, it costs two food. You do start the game with some food, so I just paid that virtually like. So now I have two. Levites, you also would gain the reward, in this case, cinders. The types of uh, resources are going to be the black are cinders, the white are stone, we have wood, and then gold. And gold can sub in for the other three. Um, and sometimes things call for gold specifically. So, um, yeah. So say I had some resources here. Let's say I got some wood, stone, and gold. Fun stuff and I have my eight red banners. So one thing you can do is for every Levite you have here, you can add a resource to the temple. Um, and where you add it will cost different amounts and stuff. So it'll cost like one red banner, two, three, four, or five. You can work on whatever row you want at whatever time. You'll just always go to the left most available space uh, that's, a, that's possible within that row. So again, if I want to go right here to the, I'm going to pay five banners, drop a gold right here, bam, that's cool, but I couldn't put in this middle column or the rightmost because the left hasn't been filled, if that makes sense. But you don't have to work bottom to top. Um, when you do this, you will immediately gain the reward that's to the right. So again, if I only use one red banner, pretty cheap, but I don't get an instant reward. Uh, other than victory points that you'll score. So if you use stone or wood, you'll gain one victory point for every resource you add at the time of adding it. You can't place cinders in the temple. If you use gold, you'll get two points. And then again, the height at which you place will dictate what your reward is. Might be a silver, a food. You can move your tent, which will give you rewards as you go around and around through here. Uh, or a worker, because we start off with six, but we have like 10 odd more in the supply waiting to be earned. Um, so it pays to go way up there, but if I have eight banners, okay, I just ate six of them, or sorry, five of them by going there, but I gain a worker to my supply, uh, and I gain two points because it's gold, and you go around, there's actually a point track, which has not been common for Garfield since, I don't know, since Raiders of the North Sea, maybe? <laughs> there's a point track, baby, they're back. Um, my whole cries every time they show me a solo game, so I get that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that is adding stuff. And if I wanted to, since I have another Levite here in this uh, area, I could add a second resource. And there's also the uh, putting, you know, keeping the fire of the altar going uh, by spending one or three banners and one cinders or a wood to move forward on this track one or two spaces. So if I have one red banner uh, and a cinders, I could pop forward one spot. If I had a wood instead that I wanted to spend, which I still do, I can use my remaining three banners, one, two, three, to pop forward here. You'll gain any things that are below you as you advance on the track. And in general, it's good to be moving up this track for the Sabbath because we have uh, Zechariah and Haggai, again, I'm probably butchering these, I'll learn all these, uh, where you don't wanna be below, you know, you wanna be moving up and keeping up with them as they teach, so they are, uh, on the board, and they will continue to move up throughout. Uh, and it's also a tiebreaker, including tiebreaker for the game, as whoever's furthest ahead on the track. And if you're on the bottom of a stack, you are further ahead than people above you. Um, yeah, so moving along here gives you some boons, gives you some stuff uh, to do, and all that good fun stuff. So, um, again, you are limited here by the obviously the cost of the banners, but you're limited by how many Levites you have in this area. So in this case, I did one resource and one bump up on the altar track. I now have used my two workers. I also used all my banners, so it kind of worked out. That was an efficient first turn. But you couldn't just do a bunch of things if you don't have enough kind of Levites to do it. But I could have used my last three banners to place something in, in the... Uh, temple or have done both of my actions for the altar or whatever, it's up to you, but you are limited by the amount of folks you have here and you have to pay food 
to uh, essentially you're making offerings and stuff to the temple to place your Levites there, uh, where they remain for the rest of the game. So just note that as well with like your supply. Certain times there's going to be workers that go out and they stick around for the rest of the game. So uh, they're just Levites now. They're just chilling. Um, uh, Zechariah and Haggai, uh, good print. Okay, cool. Hoping so. I'm like, I've, you know, these names are like, have been heard before, but, you know, I, I'm not intimately familiar. So I always try to want to get stuff right. But in general, that's the red action. So again, that's like not too complicated. Now, how you kind of get to your, uh, <laughs> you know, building up the resources you need and stuff. Uh, you know, obviously I would need to have resources to help build the temple and things like that. Uh, you know, that's where I think a lot of the crunch is going to come in. Is just how do I... Uh, Levite. Okay. Ah, I didn't know. I didn't know which it would be. Uh, what took a stab. So Levite. Okay. Thank you. This looks visually stunning. Shame about uh, the religious theme. It's more of a historical theme. Uh, it's just about Jerusalem in the day. It's not religious. Um, it's just about, I guess they're teaching the Torah and stuff, but, uh, I see it as more of a historical game. Uh, but of course that might not be for everybody. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be about that kind of resource, conversion-y uh, claiming and stuff. So a good way to get resource from the rubble is by working on <laughs> clearing the rubble from the city and building up walls and gates. So this is the action that pertains to the gray banner, this middle action here. So when you uh, take this action, you're gonna choose one unbuilt uh, wall or gate to, to home in on, only once. You can't be working on multiple. So say I'm doing this one right here. This is the gate for me. Um, or I should say the wall section. It'll be labeled as a gate if it's a gate. And there will also be cards over here pertaining to the gates. Say so I'm doing this section of wall. I want to help build up this wall. Uh, here you'll get banners and stuff. But again, now we're counting for gray, not red. So say I have, I don't know, 10 gray banners. We're just crushing on gray. Again, I will have, I will have played uh, this card here to have, you know, earn some extra gray banners and stuff like that. Uh, when you go to do this action, you can uh, clear rubble and or, if there's no rubble, build a wall or build a section of, uh, of gate. So, uh, Ali, that's no worries. Uh, that's no worries. Not every game's gonna be for everybody. That's totally fine. Um, so if there's rubble here, you can't obviously build until the rubble's clear, but this will be a good way to gain some resources. So right here in the kind of middle of the board, it just shows you the cost in banners it takes to remove rubble, which conveniently goes right into your supply uh, to be used later. Uh, so any cinders, the black cubes takes one banner. Wood and stone, the white and brown, uh, take two banners and gold takes three. So to clear off this whole section, I would need one uh, banner for the cinders, two for the wood, three for the gold, six total. And I could just go blam, clear all of those straight away. And now I have a section of wall that I could build, um, which is cool. So one thing to note on a lot of the sections of wall, actually is it all of them? Looks like it is all of them. When you clear the last bit of rubble, you'll get a blessing, which will be these areas here. There's uh, orange, purple and red, these little vases. In this case, I would get purple, so I would come up one spot here for clearing the rubble. Just because I clear the rubble here does not mean that I have to build a wall. And also there could be a turn later where there's a section of wall that is cleared of rubble, someone else did it or I did, and I could just go in and straight away build that wall. But remember on this turn, these actions, you're only ever focusing on one section of wall or gate that you're going to uh, work with. So. Again, I've spent six uh, uh, banners to do that. I have 10 in my virtual world where I get to control everything, super cool. So now if I wanted to, I could build uh, this bit of wall or gate. Um, and let's say I had 12 banners actually. Let's say I had 12. Um, <laughs> so I have six left over. It'll be for example purposes. Uh, so I want to go ahead and build this, this section of wall. So they're all pre-printed on here, what they're going to cost. Gates always have the same cost. Um, they're always going to cost you, is it on here? Um, it must be listed somewhere. They have a static cost, but the walls will cost what's showing. So in this case, it'll take me three gray banners and three stone 
to build this wall. And then we actually have a deck of wall cards. Shouts out to Paladins. Um, and when you build this section, you will cover up, uh, you'll draw three cards, uh, choose one to place on this spot. So you'll be kind of claiming that. Uh, you'll get a little instant reward in two points at the end of the game. Uh, and you might make a connection to gates and stuff now or later, which will give you uh, an additional bonus, which we'll talk about in a second. So in this case, again, three banners. I have 12, I spent six, I have six more. Three banners, three stone. So I only have one stone, unfortunately, womp, womp. But when building, you can always use either three banners or a gold to discount a wood or stone cost by one. So in this case, I could do uh, one stone, I'll use a gold for my second, and then my three banners left over uh, to cover the cost of that. And then I'll draw three cards here, cut blam, blam, blam. Choose one to play. It's gonna be this one right here, and then you'll get the reward in the middle, and then it has your little player color here so that we know at the end of the game who to assign these points to, which will be uh, at the very end of the game. And then these two cards, one goes on top of your deck, one on the bottom, again, borrowing from Paladins, and you can do that whatever order you like. Um, yeah, it's kind of a race, Nick, to clear the rubble. It's gonna be, I think, the easiest way to get your resources. So I think you're gonna have to do this action every so often to kind of pull over resources to then use uh, in potentially other areas of the game. Um, certainly with building up the temple and things like that. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Um, when going to build a gate, you could choose one of the unbuilt gates to also build. Um, you'll take one the associated card here. So let's say the old gate here. Oh, where's the old gate? Or, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, let me do like the valley gate right here. Again, you have to clear rubble. Um, and here, these ones, oh, it's printed, that's why, duh. Um, they also have a static cost of one wood and two stone, and then three banners. So, bam, I clear the valley gate. I could pop the valley gate here. And what's kind of cool is when you do this, you have to put a worker down, and be, they become a gatekeeper where they will remain and watch the gate for the rest of the game. This will often have an instant reward when you cover this up. In this case, I can like retrieve one of my elders or traders and bring them back to my supply. So I could like re, you know, trigger that. So say I did this, kaboom, this will come back. And then at the top here, there's like a little bonus that is gonna get made when connections to the wall pieces on either side get made. And this can happen in either order. So say I built this gate first, and then me or somebody else for that matter builds the wall next to it on either side or you know, if there's wall here, wall here, and then the gate comes in the middle, you'll trigger this bonus. So basically, whatever players are part of this connection are gonna get the reward at the top. So again, very much like Viscounts when you're making the connections around the outside of the board, same thing. And in fact, if it's me doing both of these, blue and blue, I still only get this once. I do not get it both times. But if it was me and red, we would both get the reward. So in this case, one food, one silver. And that can work either way. Then again, if someone builds a wall over here, this would trigger again. Um, so that is kind of a cool little thing. So there's uh, different gates that can get built and these cards will, will go out as they get built. Um, yeah, so there's that. And there will often be silver on these cards. Uh, I think at the start of a two-player game, there'll be two silver on each of those cards. So again, you would collect that when you go to build the gate as well. Um, this game is so good. I can't wait to uh, play physical. Yeah, board to play. You've actually played it before. I've only read the rules and taken a gander. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool. So you have your own little deck of wall cards with their own abilities. The gate cards, everyone's kind of racing for. They're worth four points as well. And whatever workers on that will be clearly the owner of that card. So... The more you kind of build out on here, the more kind of points you can get all at the end game, uh, very end of the game. So that is the building rubble walls, gates, <laughs> on and on and on section. But it seems like the best way to grab that, um, those resources for powering up your other stuff. The third and final type of action uh, has to do with your blue banners. And it's gonna have to do with teaching the Torah and going around and kind of teaching folks who are living uh, outside the city walls in these kind of tent cities nearby. People haven't been like rehomed just yet back in the city. So again, count up, same thing. I'll, this time you'll go for all of your blue uh, banners. And um, you can 
basically do uh, a, a couple things. So one, you can use uh, two, four, seven, or 10, and sometimes you have to pay resources, banners and resources to move your tent one, two, three, or four spaces. And there's bonuses in between that you'll just collect by hopping around. And you kind of go around and around and around. There's no like leader of this, so it doesn't matter how many tents are on a space or anything like that. It's just kind of a good way to get some bonuses. So say I, I was going all in. 10 banners and a, a stone, or I'll say a wood, for example, right? I would go one, two, three, four. In this case, I would get a purple blessing. So kabam, let's actually say this red was already here for example purposes. Two food, a worker, and then an orange blessing. Kabam. Um, so it's kind of a great way to get um, a bunch of, uh, bunch of kind of stuff done uh, real quick. So um, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. One thing to note with the blessings as we move our way up here, uh, this is something that will give you a reward every time. Let me go back to my little closer shot real quick. Every time you kind of move whatever furthest thing is behind to a new level, you'll get the bonus that's at the top. So in this case, I'd move up the altar. So it's not when you reach one for the first time, but if I like go here so that all three have reached or passed the first space, they don't all have to be in the same space at the same time, you'll get the associated bonus and you start to get points at the very end. So in this case, I'd bump up instantly one spot on the altar track, uh, kaboom, and then you have a bunch of friends and people think you're super cool. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that. So as you kind of move up in a balanced way, you get more rewarded uh, for your efforts there. Going back to the main board, um, so you can kind of go around, around the tents and get some stuff. Uh, or you can claim a scroll tile, uh, and this kind of works in like a little card pyramid thing where you can't just jump up to the top. You have to kind of, it doesn't have to be you necessarily, but there has to be people. I'm going to bust out my little other player here for example, porpoises. So let's say this person had claimed the Nehemiah hero card. Boom. So they had that over there. Um, and say I had built here. For example, um, and I built here. Okay. <laughs> so, when you go to do this, you basically only have access to stuff that you can reach from an from another scribe, yours or another player. So, uh, if I wanted to go here, for example, I would have to go branch off through this red uh, worker. You can't just go horizontal over. You're kind of always working your way up from the bottom. Uh, so, if I wanted to go here, I totally could because the red person's here. So, they have access to both of these, or they've created access to both of these uh, tiles. So, I could place here. If I wanted to go, if there was workers here, now example, I have access to this, 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 because my workers are here. And when you go up through, so again, if I wanted to build right here, you have to go up through, you have to pay people who kind of did their homework before you. Because I, I, I attribute this to like, you're borrowing off of their study and, and sort of uh, refining and going from there. So say red to place on Nehemiah, I want to place here, I have to pay them one silver. If I was going up through here though, I don't have to pay for my own people, but if they had, gone here, for example, and I want to go to this spot specifically, I'll build, branch up through them. So one, two silver, then I can place here. If I want to go here instead, I could go one, two, three, all of my own people, I wouldn't have to pay. So there's that little bit of jockeying for position and stuff. But once something's here, you can reach the next level uh, if there's at least basically an unbroken chain of workers, regardless of color, to the ba back to the bottom. And if you're the first person to go into a new row, you'll get maybe a bit of food, and at the end of the game, you know, each of your scribes on this level are worth two points and three points and four points. And also these top ones give you end game scoring things to go for. So these in the middle are going to give you uh, in game bonuses and discounts like this one right here means every time that you're building a gate or a wall, you get a one stone discount if your worker is the one on here. And each of these has space for exactly one worker. So they're kind of like little technologies and things you can get. Uh, and then the top row is reserved for uh, end game scoring. So if you are, uh, you know, the one with the control over that at the end of the game, you might get some points out of it. So, um, and I don't know what they all do, but there is references to uh, all the character cards, 
all of the scroll tiles and stuff in the back of the book. Uh, all the upgradable development tiles, stuff like that. So that's the blue action uh, in a nutshell, is gaining kind of the ability to, you know, have more cards in your hand, get discounts of food and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, all useful abilities for sure. And the cost to go and place a worker is uh, by row. So three banners and two silver for the bottom row. Uh, five banners and three silver for this one, six and a gold for the third row. And the top row is seven banners and two gold. But of course, this is by far the most valuable. It's worth the most points just for the scribe being there. And then also those end game, uh, access to the end game points. So um, yeah, that's in a nutshell the three actions. So we are gonna take six turns, um, which comprise of playing one card out, taking one of the main actions, maybe doing some auxiliary actions and stuff like that. Then after we have played uh, six cards, uh, we go into the Sabbath, which is kind of a resetting, re you know, sc interim scoring uh, phase. And, um, and then we kind of reset and do it again. And on the back here is reminders of Preparing for the Sabbath, what happens during the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, kind of the resetting in, after rounds one and two, and then also end game scoring. So the player aid really kind of holds a lot. So uh, one thing to do right before the Sabbath is if you have any extra workers who are, have not been placed in some place or other, they immediately have to become a laborer, a laborer or a farmer just temporarily. So every person that gets placed as a farmer, at least from my development tile, is like two food. So if I go here, two food, four food, the laborer will always have a choice. So in this case, I can get two uh, resources, anything but gold, so I can get cinders, wood, or stone, or one resource and two silver. So you're gonna have to assign all of them to those areas to get some resources. Um, and then as you develop, like for example, this, there might be little abilities, oh, let me go back here real quick. There might be little abilities that you get that happen right before the Sabbath. There's like this little symbol here. So in this case, I can retrieve one of my elders or traders and immediately make them uh, a farmer or laborer to get a little bonus resource, and then we go into the Sabbath. So um, once we are in the Sabbath, one thing you gotta do is you gotta feed your people. So uh, anyone that is basically being used by you, anything in the main supply that you haven't claimed, you don't have to feed, and uh, Levites, excuse me, don't need to be fed because they're, they're already basically feeding, uh, they're being fed at the temple. But the rest of your workers uh, need to be fed. So in this case, I've got a gatekeeper here. So one, two, three, four, five, six food. For every uh, worker you can't feed, you lose two points. Um, and the, if you just want to do easy math, you have 16 workers total. So you have 16 minus however many are here and however many are here because you haven't claimed them yet. Um, yeah, so you have to feed your peeps, first and foremost. Um, and then you have to tuck cards under your player aid. So if I have my six cards played, let's pretend I did all this right. One, two, three, four, five, six. In the first and third round, you have to tuck one card. In the second round, you have to tuck two of them. So the nice thing is it's going to give you permanent banners, but you're going to lose their ability for their trade uh, and stuff like that, but it also gives you access to the scoring at the top of their card. So it's the first round. Um, I'm gonna do this one, boom. So now I have a permanent gray banner, just the one. You don't get all three anymore. It's just the one that's showing at the very top. And this uh, scoring gives me one point plus one point for every tile I've upgraded, development tile. I've upgraded just this one right now, uh, so I will uh, get two points in this case. And that'll happen every round, including right when it gets tucked, and then any rounds to happen after that. So in the very first round, I've tucked this one, so this is gonna score two more times. Hopefully I've developed some tiles by then and stuff. Um, Sam up in here, the ultimate beige game. It is though, right? <laughs> Sam's one of the designers along with Shem. Uh, you do, y'all do beige good. Beige is okay. We shouldn't make that a taboo, you know? If it's good, if it's beige and boring, then like, what are we really doing? Uh, also, by messing up any rules uh, horrendously, Sam, let me know. Uh, but, do, you know, do it nice and stuff. Make, make, me, make me feel good about myself. Um, so these will score multiple times. So this might give you some like direction, like, okay, I've already got one development tile upgraded. It's worth two points on its own. I'm gonna get, you know, 
This is gonna trigger two more times, so at a minimum, I'm getting four more points out of this. Let me try to get at least one of these done every round to try to maximize on that. And by the end of the game, you're gonna have four of them tucked uh, that will kind of go into the scoring and stuff. So, But you also don't have that card now to use for its banners, uh, with the exception of the one. So, you know, and the trade ability, so what are you giving up uh, there is um, something to consider. So yeah, um, in a nutshell, that's the game. So we just did, you know, talked about the three types of actions. You're doing one of those per round. Um, uh, after the sixth round, Sabbath happens. After the Sabbath, we, you know, get our workers back that have been committed. Uh, any of these folks out on the board and stuff, they're, they're there now. Um, but, you know, workers kind of on our board and stuff, elders, traders, farmers, laborers, come on back. Uh, you get your cards back, minus things that were tucked. Um, let's see. The profits here are going to move. So uh, now in the second round, this is moving up to four. Zechariah and Hag Haggai are going to move up. So again, you need to kind of keep moving up because in the second round, if you're not even to Zechariah, you lose two points. If you're in between uh, Zechariah and Haggai, you get a wood. And then if you're beyond either of them, both of them, I should say, you get to, in this case, to move your tent and get a point. So you want to be working on that track. You also get many benefits along the way, and it is that ultimate kind of tiebreaker for anything that requires tie breaking uh it's broken by the altar so other things that require tie breaking as we kind of build up the temple if you complete sections there's kind of three slightly different shades of colors here that make different sections in this case it's each column in a two-player game which is convenient when that section gets completely filled in with resources we quickly um give out some little bonuses and things like this so again this is set up for a two-player game but uh it would go as this, the person who puts the last resource to put you know, piece in the puzzle gets two um, food right away. Whoever is furthest uh, on the altar track gets two points. Uh, and then um, for each Levite, I believe, that you have in the temple, you gain a silver. Uh, so there are gonna be like little rewards like that for each time a section gets filled. Those will change slightly. Like when you get to like a three player game, if you're the furthest behind the altar track, you start losing points. But otherwise, you get some food if you complete it. You're rewarded for being on the altar track, you know, further than anybody else. Uh, and you get some silver. So there's a lot of reasons why it's good to be, be on that altar, uh, beefing it up and stuff. But you got to get some Levites in the temple to really uh, keep that going. Um, Bible Board Games is catching up uh, with chat real quick. Seriously, my wallet can't keep up. Cosmic Beat. Dude, Garfield just cranks him out. <laughs> Where the place is beige done right. I agree. I think there is such a thing as beige being done right. Um, this game looks like it has lots of replay variation if newbies uh, can get past the initial learning curve. Yeah, I feel like this... This. Um, what's up, Shem? Uh, I was going to email you, by the way, and say, like, hey, are you cool with me doing this? I was like, I'm just going to do it. So if you need to write me a sternly worded email, I understand. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, with these games, there's always that initial hit of, like rules like you know any mid-weight heavy side of mid weight euro game will have some amount of like i'm gonna spit rules at you for a while but this one really does come down like this player aid's really nice this player aid tile because it does break it down to like what you can do on a turn like i feel like a lot of their games come down to how do I accomplish the things I want to do on the turn? But what you can do on a turn is not overly complicated. Um, there's only three types of actions. They're mostly use your banners and resources. Well, how do I get resources? Okay, well, let me think about that. Well, I can clear some rubble from over here and get a bunch of stone because I want to build uh, this section of wall later or whatever. So I think it, it's all kind of there for you. Um, but there's a, a seriously a ton to munch on in terms of like, how do I accomplish this? How do I do this efficiently? Um, and you know, what tiles do I get here to, to help me break some of those rules for myself? And based on that, what direction do I go? You know, and things like that, which is like always my favorite thing. I don't want to be stuck thinking about like nitpicky rules, like tiny little things like, oh, every time you do this, you're supposed to move this over here. It's like, I like games that can keep stuff simple enough so that you can dedicate as much 
uh, in my case, limited brain power uh, to like strategizing as possible um, versus having to just remember. Uh, yeah, so hit me up with any questions or ask Shem and Sam who designed the game and, and clearly know it better than I do. I've read the rules one time and never played it. They played it, I think five to six times they play it before they print them. Uh, so they're pretty much experts. Uh, Holy see another game from Garfield I have to buy. Well, hey, October, campaign's going live. We'll have our playthrough video of this uh, in a, I don't know, where are we? Uh, two weeks, call it. Uh, early October, beginning of October. So two and a half weeks. Uh, what's up, crook? This game looks like that beige hotness I love. <laughs> it does. Uh, where I was thinking about you when, when setting this up. I was like, yeah. We gotta get this played. And also, can I just drop out here? Uh, or, or I have a question, Shem and Sam. Question for you. Is this the expected box size? Because I know with the uh, trilogies, you've gone up in size a bit, but this is more the classic Garfield game size. But I don't know if this is the plan or if what we have isn't reflective of, of the final product. So I don't want to speak out of, out of turn. But um, either way, I like it. The board, not too large. It's a sensible size <laughs> so that you can actually play a four player game on a game table. These are, you know, there's still a lot going on and stuff, but thank you for not making the board three inches wider for, you know, whatever reason. I feel like a lot of games just kind of go like Broop, a little bit. And I'm like, no, don't do that. Um, uh, so ancient anthology is staying in that size. Yes. Yeah, so this is the uh, kind of the old school uh, Garfield size box, AKA or same as the ancient anthology, which is again, Legacy of You, Hadrian's Wall, Ezra and Nehemiah, and more to come are in this kind of smaller box, which is always a flex. And this box, similar to Paladins, is packed full. <laughs> so uh, you get a lot of content here. Lots to explore. There's a bunch more of the tiles, um, which will greatly, I imagine these, the wood tile, these kind of middle two rows, uh, depending on which ones of those are available, I could see it changing up stuff you go for greatly. So. I'm super excited. Oh, yeah, Raiders of Scythia as well. Thank you, that too. Um, so this is the fourth game in the line, I guess. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's all I got for you, y'all. If there's any other questions, let me know. Um, Shem and Sam, thanks for, for popping in. This has been a treat. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to play this. Nick's not here, so it's his fault that I haven't played it yet. I've had it for days. Just been looking at it, wondering about it, you know? Just been like, organizing it but he's not home and so it's his fault i can't play it i could solo it maybe i'll solo it because i don't want to wait <laughs> i look forward to the brothers murray playthrough yeah so let's see we have uh uh, uh it's it slated for the third of october tuesday what is that what is that Three weeks from Tuesday, boom. Barely even 19 days from now, it'll be live. Maybe we'll get wild and just drop in the middle of the night one day uh, earlier than that, I don't know. But we, want, we like to keep them somewhat close to the campaign, but a little bit ahead so people get the hype built up. So uh, stay tuned for information on the campaign stuff. It'll be coming soon. Um, and uh, in the meantime, this has just been like a quick little, a little peek a cheeky peek, as we like to call it. Uh, a cosmic beat, yeah, upcoming videos. We're gonna do, uh, the plan is to do a playthrough video that'll come out October 3rd, 10-3, which is, gosh, what is that? Mean Girls Day or something. There's something about Mean Girls that's on October 3rd. It's coming out on Mean Girls Day. Uh, we're trying to talk behind you, but who's talking about my neck? Don't be doing that. Let me talk, or you're talking about Nick's back? That's fine. Don't talk about my, yeah, I see it. You can talk about behind Nick's back. That's cool. Not mine. Um, all right, y'all, I'm gonna get the heck out of here. Thanks so much for hanging out. Uh, again, if you're watching this video after the fact and it's not live anymore, turn on the live chat so you can see what I'm referring to when I'm randomly talking to other people who are clearly not in the room with me. Uh, I'm not crazy. You're crazy. Uh, <laughs> I'll catch y'all next time. And that has been Ezra and Nehemiah. Get hyped for it. Coming up soon. Bye.